Come on, Come on up a little bit. Huh? Come on up a little bit. Okay. Are you comfortable back there? Okay, here, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Ready? Are we ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, yeah, the topic for this week, this is week eight, is program music. Program music is defined as music that tells a story. Um, it became into its own, we've seen that before um, in the Baroque era, we, we, uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons was a, was a piece of program music. Um, he had the birds and, the, and the, the babbling brook and so forth and so on. But in the classical age, program music was not a very big number. And in the, cla in the Romantic age, it came into its own, partly because the Romanticists were trying to, as we've talked about before, move out of the conventions of their fo musical forms. And one way to do that is to write music about a storyline. Right? So the story is something other than the musical form that's given. Um, and so this kind of drifting between um, different genres, literature and art and music, um, became part of what the Romanticists were fascinated by. We're going to um, focus particularly on one piece today with a couple others just as, as foils, I think, to show you a couple of variations on the theme. But the, the piece we'll focus on today is by Hector Berlioz, um, French, looks like Hector Berlioz, uh, born in 1803, so now we've got both feet in the 19th century. Um, and he um, studied at the Paris Conservatory, fell in love with a, an actress named Harriet Smithman, Smith, no, Smithson, and um, wrote her these, she didn't, he didn't know her, he hadn't met her actually, um, wrote her these passioned, impassioned letters that were so impassioned that she thought he was a bit nuts <laughs> and kind of avoided him. And so uh, years later, uh, um, they met after she went to a concert uh, which featured Symf Symphonie Fantastique and realized that Symphony was about her. And, um, and they um, started dating, I guess, married. Um, marriage didn't last, but lasted for a while, apparently. And uh, that's sort of the backstory. <coughs> um, we've talked about romantic music as not really about, at least, uh, primarily not about romance in the sense of love, but uh, romance in the sense of trying to find a transcendent realm, right? something beyond the physical, beyond the conventional, beyond the earthly, beyond the societal. Uh, but in this case, with in the case of love, an unrequited love, of course, is kind of feels like, gives the sensation of something that's beyond our reach, and the more you get obsessed with that, as Berlioz certainly was obsessed, um, the more it starts to feel like something that is spiritual. You know, you can, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a naivete, perhaps, but it's a, it's a very alluring the naivete, naivete. What Hector Berlioz did with this piece, though, was quite remarkable. And whether it was because of his musical skill, or because of his passion for this woman, or a, more, more likely a combination of the two, his imagination really went into places where he, where nobody had been before in terms of musical form, in terms of the way he could use instruments to create sounds that no one had heard before. We've seen a little bit of that before. We've said when the ghost comes in in Don Giovanni, those three trombones in the background created a sound that nobody had heard before. So that sort of thing has happened before. But now in the 19th century, when composers are looking for new sounds and ways of getting out of the conventional sound um, that, that was handed down by the, by the forms that they knew, um, they became quite ingenious about trying to create combinations of instruments, bringing new instruments in. One of the instruments that we're going to hear in this piece is the E-flat clarinet. I don't know, the, the, the soprano clarinet, so to speak. A clarinet, a normal clarinet, B-flat clarinet is about this big. And um, has a warm, um, sort of sinewy sound, uh, sort of in the lower soprano alto range. Of, if you're thinking about singers, the E flat clarinet is about like this, and is much higher. 
and, and quite abrasive, actually. It's a kind of, it's a very nasal sound, a very kind of cutting sound. And um, <clears throat> just as the character in this program, in this story, is starting to go off the deep edge, <laughs> we start to hear that the E-flat clarinet come in um, in a very strange and kind of abrasive way. So we'll, we'll see. For example, that's just one, one of many examples in this piece where Berlioz um, takes us. I'm going to start, I think, with the Symphonie Fantastique. We'll listen to a little bit of it. Um, then I'd like to go back again, pick up the cello again, and take us one step further when we talk about harmony, and then come back to the symphony and t see if we can make the connection between what we've been talking about, which is difficult, especially with harmony, um, and this, the music that we've listened to. So right now, this is the, we're not, there are five movements to this symphony. Uh, oh, and let me just read you quickly before the before we go into the music. Let me read you the the overarching program. Berlioz himself wrote the program. Said this is what's going on in the music, and you don't get that in a classical piece. The music is about the music. Now it's about this, and um, and I quote: "A young musician of extraordinary sensibility. He's not um, exactly you know humble." Uh, an abundant imagination, in the depths of despair because of hopeless love, has poisoned himself with opium. That'll help. That's me, by the way. Uh, the drug is too feeble to kill him, but plunges him into a heavy sleep, accompanied by weird visions. His sensations, emotions, and memories, as they pass through his affected mind, are transformed into musical images and ideas. The beloved one herself becomes to him a melody, a recurrent theme. In parentheses, he writes the French, I mean, he's writing in French, of course, so this is a translation, idée fixe. An idée fixe becomes a technical term in music, and it starts really here with, um, arguably, with Berlioz. Now, we've seen something like an idée fixe before with uh, Beethoven's fifth, for example, ya da da da, da 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 that little motif, which becomes a building block of that entire symphony, believe it or not, all four movements. Um, that is something like an idée fix. But this is actually a, a melody which um, becomes the character of this woman that he's fallen in love with. And, and, and so, um, once more, that sentence, the beloved one herself becomes to him a melody, a recurrent theme, an idée fix which haunts him continually. Now in the first couple of movements, the first three movements, we have three different scenes in which he's, for example, in the country and thinking about her, and then there's a ballroom the scene in which um, the idée fix turns into a dance, like a, like a waltz. So the idée fix, this little melody, has a diff couple of different variations, um, and we're going to see the last two variations in the fourth movement and in the fifth movement. Real quickly, the fourth movement is the march to the scaffold. Now here's the, here's the program. The, the program I just read was for the entire symphony. This is now the fourth movement. In the fourth movement, this is what happens. He dreams that he has murdered his beloved. It gets dramatic. Um, that he has been condemned to death and is being led to the scaffold. The procession moves forward to the sounds of a march that is now somber and fierce, now brilliant and solemn, it changes its character, in which the muffled sounds of heavy steps give way without transition to the noisiest out outbursts. It's a raucous crowd, apparently, that's come to his execution. At the end, the idée fix returns for a brief moment, and you'll hear it at the very end of this movement. It's not a very long movement. Like, like a last thought of love interrupted by the death blow. And the death blow you hear too, it's this big bonk chord. Um, but let me just play you that idée fix, which runs through the entire symphony, all five movements, and so that you can, if I can find it here. Oh, here it is. All right, and so um, you'll recognize this maybe at the end. Hello, of the piece. Jazz in the background. Uh, so, um, it's not obviously a real classical melody. It feels like it doesn't really have 
um, an antecedent, a consequent. It kind of floats around. comes up, it comes as an allegro, which is a little faster than that. So it's, yeah, something like maybe this. and in the March to the Scaffold, you're here at the very end when he thinks of her just before he gets his head chopped off. The, the charming part of the, the, um, the execution is that you hear this blow, which is the guillotine. You know, the French had the guillotine in the 19th century, before that already. And um, you hear the, the blow. And then, believe it or not, you hear this flump, 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 which is the head rolling, bouncing down. And it's, he had a sense of humor, too. I mean, I think he was desperately in love, but he was also a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Here goes, the beginning of Symphonique of I'll, I'll stop occasionally and show you a couple of things as we go through it, but um, we'll just start to get the little piece all over first. If I can find it a little bit. Make sure the sound is on. for just a moment and point out that theme. We started out with dum -dum 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 -dum. A, lot of, a lot of drumming and a lot of sort of the sense of marching, right? But now comes this theme. And I want to point, out, point it out for a couple of reasons. It's sort of like an addition to the march idea. Um, but just, um, just to remind you, whoops, let's see. I think it's an easier place to see it. That uh, this theme is not classical in its construction. That's the wrong. Um, <laughs> let me try that again. Now, the funny thing about this is that it starts on three. Three, four, one, two, three.
But notice that it, it's not, it's not um, an antecedent and a consequent. It, it's sort of this strangely asymmetrical march to the scaffold. Even though it's a march, it feels a little bit off-center, right? So um, that uh, is part of what makes this thing so interesting. And then what happens in the, in the bassoons? You see four bassoons. That's quite unusual. Though what you're looking at right up there are bassoons. They're um, double reed instruments. They're in the, um, in the woodwind section. And um, normally, in a classical orchestra, there would only be two of them. But he wants this big bassoon sound in order to create sort of a strange, jagged counterpoint to, the, to that theme. So I'm going to go back about a, a minute and listen to what these guys do in contrast to that theme that you just heard, which makes the thing even more asymmetrical and more kind of not quite there. One more. There it is. This is where they start. the execution. That's the rolling head. <laughs> and that's the jazz band in the back. 
background. So, not part of the. Okay, cool. Any questions? That's basically the idea. Now, I'm going to try and create, I'll see if I can do this. I'm going to try and create out of that strangely asymmetrical melody, which is clearly romantic because it kind of doesn't have an antecedent consequent. I'm going to try to make up a classical melody out of that. Let's see if we can, and you'll notice how boring by comparison that, comparison that, that would be. This is what, what it's supposed to sound like. to go and not half and half, but let's see if I can make one. Uh, it would have to go in the other direction, something like... Maybe something like that. That was kind of symmetrical and pretty darn boring. Right? Um, so, or... Asymmetry of the thing is the thing that gives it its tension, is the thing that gives it its sense of, of uh, marching to the scaffold, I, I suppose you could say. Um, let's stop it for a moment. We'll take a, a short break while we re 